Hello, this is Ukra Life with Lyudmila Nimiri, and we continue our broadcasting from Kyiv. And we're very happy that our guest today is John Parshall. He is a specialist in Second World War, especially the Pacific. Mr. Parshall, thank you so much to be with us today. D delighted to be here again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parshall, in December 2023, you wrote a brilliant analysis uh, of the situation in Ukraine. Let me go back to this analysis and let's start from the very beginning. Let's do it. Yeah, because yes. a lot of those things didn't come true, right? Uh, no, I think many uh, come true. That is why it is very interesting analysis. Let's start from the very beginning where we are at military right now right now um you know it's it's really sort of difficult to say i feel like i feel like a lot of people here in the u.s perhaps have kind of uh i think there's a, a little bit of a loss of hope that uh ukraine is going to be able to achieve all of its its military goals i still remain hopeful uh that this war will be successful for ukraine but i admit that um, it was a very uh, a disappointing summer in a number of respects. And, you know, we're, we're in a position at this point where um, U.S. aid is uh, sort of on tenterhooks at this point. I don't know what the situation is going to be in terms of a continued flow of ammunition, which is very important for Ukraine. This is obviously a very artillery centric war. And so we've got to have more shells. But we're in a situation now where. It's mostly stasis. The Russians have something of the initiative at this point. They've obviously, they've just captured Advivka. That's that's uh, a defeat for Ukraine. I mean, let's be honest. But it was a victory that was won for the Russians at such cost that I really have to wonder if it was actually worth it for them. Meanwhile, um, interestingly, Ukraine continues to make gains in areas not necessarily on land. Um, there have been a number of really interesting developments at sea. Uh, the Ukrainians have been using, you know, nautical drone attacks to very good effect to sunk a couple of pretty important Russian warships. Uh, meanwhile, in the air, it's been a very bad week for the Russian Air Force. They've lost 10 aircraft, including a large radar surveillance plane. So those are all good trends, I guess. I see Ukraine continuing to be more innovative than the Russian military. I think that they are fighting more cleverly, but it's a very difficult time right now. Um, you know, there are a number of challenges to be overcome. And we see that obviously in things like uh, the replacement of General Zaluzhny. Um, you know, you don't go replacing generals if things are going well, right? <laughs> so it was clear that. Ukraine's political leadership felt that there was a need for new blood, new approaches, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. The bottom line is we're kind of in the middle of this thing. I still don't know how it's going to come out. I don't think anybody knows how it's going to come out. And um, yeah, it's it's a test now. It's really trying. Uh, about the difficult times. Yeah. In your analysis, uh, you compare current situation in Ukraine with the uh, uh, First World War, you say, but basically we are in 1916 right now, the midpoint. Why you say so? So uh, to take people back to World War I in 1916, what was happening there was uh, both sides had now been at war for two years and they're stuck in this horrible trench warfare in France, and the lines are basically completely static. Huge numbers of lives are being expended for practically no gain. Meanwhile, um, to, to use a sports parlance, uh, uh, cycling in particular, shell production had bonked. Um, you know, the, the armies in World War I were expending tremendous quantities of ammunition and the production, meanwhile, back in the home front had not caught up. And so 
British troops were running out of artillery ammunition, and that actually caused the downfall of the British government because there was a crisis. They didn't have enough ammo. We're sort of in the same place, I think, today in that NATO shell production still hasn't really caught up to the demand, obviously. And we've run through a lot of the short term stocks that we can use. If we look, you know, earlier, uh, you know, the U.S. finally decided, OK, we're going to let you guys have cluster munitions as well. That was a little bit of a desperation move that was saying we can't supply you enough of the conventional shells that we want to supply you. So here's these older things. They're pretty good, too. Uh, kind of a little dicey morally. But here you go. So. I think we're still waiting to see not only U.S. production, but collectively NATO and Western European production come up to speed so that we can fill in the ammunition gap. And I don't think we're there yet. It was very interesting analysis in your post. Uh, you say about army and adaptation. Let me quote you. I think it is quite important things. Armies are complex adaptive system but they have built-in limitation depending on their culture. In terms of the adaptive temper, they can uh, withstand. If you force a system to adapt too quickly across to many dimensions, it doesn't adapt, it breaks. We could have done that to the Russia in Ukraine, but we didn't. Instead, we gave them the time they needed. And after that, you give the example of why did France fall in 1940. It is very interesting because you, you are a great specialist in Second World War. Let's speak about, about this question more deeply and broader because it is very important and understandable question and problem for Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. So to go back to the fall of France, um, France in 1940 got hit with... Um, a series of tactical adaptations on the part of the German army. They'd invented this thing. We call it Blitzkrieg. Um, but you can think of it as, as the use of combined arms. I've got tanks. I've got infantry. I have these formations where everything is motorized so I can move very quickly. And I've got a ton of radios. I'm using tactical air cover as well. Um, what happened to the French army is they just couldn't learn quickly enough to adapt to all of these German adaptations and innovations. And they also didn't have enough real estate to trade for time. And so they end up getting beaten in, in very short order by the Germans. The reason I talked about that in my post was that when I look at the Ukrainian counteroffensive this last summer, I am filled with bitterness against us against the West and particularly against the U.S. Because we had every opportunity early in this war to just basically throw all our chips into the table. And we could have very easily said, as soon as this thing started, you know what? We've got 2,000 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles just sitting out in the desert that we're never going to use again. We've got, I don't know how many hundreds of Abrams tanks that we're never going to use again. We're putting them all on the ships. You're going to get them all because we're not going to use them. If we had supplied um, cluster ammunition, F-16s, all of those armored vehicles, you know, just basically told the Russians from day one, you're done. This is not going to work. We are not going to let you win this war. And then covered the material gaps that the Ukrainian army so desperately needed at that point in time. I think that, you know, we could have potentially kept the momentum running after the Kharkiv offensive because the material hardware would have been there and the Russians never would have had the time to sow these immense minefields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at the failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive not so much as being a failure on the part of the Ukrainian military, but a failure uh, on, of willpower on the part of the Americans and NATO. Now, obviously, you know, President Biden is playing a very delicate game here in that it's, it's one thing ex post facto for a guy like me to say, well, we should have just given them everything. 
But at the time, of course, he's trying to manage this conflict in such a way that it doesn't go into nuclear fireballs. That's not good for anybody. So the problem is now, of course, how do you regain the momentum in this war? How do we present the Russian army with a new set of adaptations that they have to make that hopefully breaks them in some way? And I don't know the answer to that. I wish I had a magic crystal ball. It's clear that the Ukrainian military is continuing to do innovative things in terms of networked warfare, use of drones um, to negate uh, some of the Russian advantage in artillery firepower. But I don't know if that's going to be transformative enough to uh, actually place the Ukrainian military in a position where it can advance again, because that's what we need to be able to do is retake ground. How to regain this war? Uh, it is a very interesting question, because, for example, many foreign experts and uh, for even foreign leaders and journalists, analysts, say that this year, 2024, will be the year of strategic defense for Ukraine. Mm. But many uh, military analysts say that if Ukraine will use only this strategic defense, uh, it gives Russia possibility to have initiative on the battlefield. And in that case, uh, Ukraine could be weaker in, uh, 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 in this situation on the battlefield. Yeah. What history say about that? How how it, it could combine the strategic defense and the initiative on the battlefield? What, what, yeah. what are examples, for example? No, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think we find ourselves in a in a situation, and, and again, I don't know the calculus within the Ukrainian military's upper command levels. I don't know if they think that they can actually take the offensive in this in this coming year or not. Even if the Ukrainians find themselves in a position of having to play strategic defense, it is going to have to be a very active defense. Um, and, and again, to to use parallels from World War II. If you look at the Russian uh, counteroffensive around Moscow in December of 1941 that pushes the German army back from the gates of Moscow, one of the things that you see about the Wehrmacht is that even when it was in retreat, it was still constantly looking for opportunities to counterattack, even at just a little local level, you know. Um, if I can just delay these guys, ambush them here, inflict casualties, even while I'm still pulling back. What I'm creating there is a situation where my uh, attrition ratio is heavily in my favor. And so even though I'm being uh, beaten clearly on uh, at the operational level, in the middle level of warfare, and I'm having to pull back at the tactical level, in many cases, uh, the Wehrmacht was making the Russian army pay more heavily than it than it needed to for these hamlets and villages that they were retaking so again if we look at advivka um here's a situation that is clearly an operational level defeat but at the tactical level was the price that the russian army paid to capture that town really worth it i kind of don't think so um you know the reports of the number of kia that have come out of there are, are eye-watering Yes, on the one hand, Russia has demonstrated that they're insensitive to casualties. And in fact, that's one of the that's almost intentional on their part is to advertise the fact that, yeah, we do these human meat wave attacks and we just don't care because we don't have to. But over the long term, I just don't think that that's really sustainable for the Russian military. So back to your basic question. Yes, even if we are using 2024 as a year to rebuild um create new capabilities where we think that we can take the offensive maybe in 2025. Um, the defense on the part of the Ukrainians needs to be very, very active and needs to continue scoring, uh, what do I want to say, kind of flamboyant victories every now and then just to demonstrate, hey, we're still in this thing, you know, and we can pull off wins. Again, looking at the naval combat that's been going on, whoa, you know, <laughs> we've sunk a couple of Russian ships. That's all good stuff. So. Yeah, I, I don't know what 2024 holds for us. I, I will say that 
I feel like the war in in many ways is still very much the same war that it was at the beginning of this thing. I, a lot of people, nobody talks about Crimea anymore, right? Or, or Sevastopol. Because it just it seems like Sevastopol might as well be on the moon as far as, you know, could the Ukrainians actually advance and capture that? But I still believe that Crimea really is sort of the strategic locus of this war and that it is still not beyond uh, hope that we could potentially recapture Crimea. I think that is all dependent on logistics, right? We've got to figure out some way of cutting this railroad that goes, you know, across the Sea of Azov. And we got to drop the Kerch Bridge. I've been saying it for more than a year. Other guys like Ben Hodges have been saying it, too. Um, I, I think it doesn't make sense to drop the Kerch Bridge right now because uh, that gives the Russians too much time to rebuild it or replace it or do whatever. But hopefully in the context of a larger offensive sometime in the unimaginable future, you know, we would be able to continue degrading Russian logistics to the point where we can do what we want to do and eventually recapture Crimea. We'll see. About rebuild and reforce for Russia. I think it is very important, important things when we just speak about the army and adaptation as well. Uh, why do you think it happens that Russia and Iran and South Korea have possibility to produce so much weapons mm. so quick. But our Western partners who have so big economic potential, they cannot produce enough weapons for Ukraine. Right. Because war continued two years, and uh, I think many things could be done during yeah. this time. What yeah. why do you think it's happened? What 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 is the reason? That that's a really interesting question. Um, with respect to North Korea, uh, what's going on there is that it's not so much that their absolute production is large; it's that they have been producing medium quantities of shells for seventy years now. Right, a lot of the ammunition that they're shipping to the Russians is stuff that they've dragged out of warehouses that probably was produced in the middle of the Cold War. My sense is that a lot of those shells are garbage. They 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 won't work, you know. They will they will do terrible things not only to uh Russian artillery systems in terms of barrel wear and also, you know, occasional detonations within the hardware. Um but the accuracy of those shells is going to be wretched and they're going to have a high dud rate and blah, 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 blah. But at this point in time, you know, the Russians don't really care about that. They're just like, just give me as many shells as you can as you can give me. With respect to the Iranians and some of the drone systems that we've been seeing coming from there, you know, the Shahed drone is basically a motorcycle engine with with wings. Actually, it's a lawnmower engine. Um, this is not a very sophisticated piece of equipment and so it's relatively easy to slap these things together and it's clear too i mean let's let's be you know, honest that western sanctions have not been as effective as they could be in terms of cutting off the the flow of parts to iran i mean we're finding um components in some of these drones that were made in the west in places like ireland you know so we need to tighten up those sanctions if at all possible and cut that supply off Meanwhile, back in the West, you know, why isn't our production picking up? I think part of what's going on here is that uh, we, since the beginning of the Cold War, have always taken a, a quality versus quantity approach to our weapons manufacture. And so uh, even things like artillery shells, you know, we want to produce a good shell. And this is a very capital intensive operation to put the money into the factories to buy the plant and equipment to actually ramp this production up and it's going very slowly i think that what you see happening in ukraine ukraine is actually being more adaptable in this res in respect than a lot of the western militaries and that they're like i don't care man just just give me a commercial quadcopter you know that i can buy from from China or something for 500 bucks, and I'll modify that puppy and, and make it work for me. I do know that there has been uh, a reaction to this within the U.S. military, 
we have just recently looked at some of the at our drone inventory and we're like a couple of these models are just too big and complex and they can't survive on the modern battlefield we're gonna we're gonna shelve them and so i i do think that um there needs to be more of an emphasis on our part on cheap easy to produce disposable weapons just you know just shovel this stuff out the door and and we're still not necessarily making that that mental leap and, and of course all of this is complicated at least on the american part by american politics we're just which are a, a dumpster fire at this point uh when i think about the second world war i just understand that it was different coalition from different sides this war is interesting maybe in that context because we have a different coalition as well but coalition which gives weapons for ukraine and for russia as well if you we speak about south korea iran and other yep. um how we, how we what 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 scenario are possible are, are possible in this situation because when for example nato countries say that we we don't want to be involved in this war but it is not true they're involved. You know, they sent weapons, they sent money, and as other thing. Doesn't mean that it is something similar for Second World War, but not, but, um, you know, involvement of military from different countries on the ground. How, how we, we could compare and how it could be the scenario. Do you think that the next step will be the involvement of troops, armies of different countries. Because, for example, like Macron say yesterday, that European leaders discuss the possibility of um, European uh, troops will be on the ground in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Um, I, I, again, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball on that, but I do think that there is a growing awareness on the part of some people at least within nato that a uh, 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 russia versus nato war is not out of the question it, it is clear from the rhetoric uh that you see on russian state media that they view ukraine as just the first step you know once we denazify ukraine now we're going after poland um or or the baltic states and so I, I think, too, that if you look at the NATO coalition as a whole, it's clear that the United States is the linchpin of that entire organization, at least in terms of short-term combat potential. And again, given the domestic political situation here within America, um, if you suddenly have a scenario where America is not as trustworthy a partner as it should be, which is a whole separate topic and just fills me with rage and disgust, but anyway, we'll, we'll not go there. Um, now you suddenly got a, a situation where you've got this incredibly wealthy coalition of states in Western Europe, Europe as a whole, I should say, who are not yet who who have not translated that wealth into military potential. And I do think that people like Macron, uh, you know, and, and the leadership within in Germany and Britain as well have got to be asking themselves, okay, can we actually fight Russia ourselves, by ourselves, and beat them? The answer right now is, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but from a long-term economic potential standpoint, the answer should be yes and easily. Again, if you look at this uh, from an, a purely economic standpoint, <laughs> the collective wealth and industrial power of Europe is immense. Russia's economy is about the same size as Italy, okay? <laughs> so there's no question that if the political will is there within the European leadership to say, we are going to rebuild our militaries, that within a certain amount of time, Europe could field a conventional military that would be absolutely superior to Russia's in everything except strategic arms, um, you know, nuclear weapons. 
but on the ground, they should be easily able to do that. Uh, uh, the question is, can they generate that political willpower to actually make that happen? Back to political will, it is a very interesting question, because you look very interesting uh, for uh, preamble to the USA entry to the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And you say that isolationism uh, paid really poor geostrategic dividend. It is very interesting question. Why ask it? Uh, because do you think that America now could enter to this war more active. And why do you think land lease doesn't work? Because we remember everybody that land lease was seen by President Biden. And this uh, land lease exited just one year. And after that, everything was finished. And no one weapons we receive, Ukraine receives through this land lease. Uh, do you think that land lease uh, could help us, really? Uh, because we remember the Second World War. And do you think that uh, we could speak about a land lease now? And could we compare this land lease with land lease during the Second World War? Or it is incorrect? That's a great question. Um, yeah, within the context of World War II, Lend-Lease was primarily driven by the overwhelming need on the part of the Americans to uh, make sure that Britain stayed in the war. The driver there was Britain was running out of cash. I mean, they just couldn't pay for the amount of weapons that they needed anymore. And so Franklin Roosevelt came up with, frankly, what is a bit of a fiction <laughs> that you know, we're going to lend you this stuff. You're going to give us some of your bases in return. And you're going to give us this stuff back after the after the war. When you're done with it, you'll give us it back, which sort of ignores the fact that when you lend somebody a tank, it pretty often doesn't really come back in working order anymore. Right. So it, it was a fiction, but it was a very effective fiction. It, it satisfied everybody's needs in that it let the British have the, the weapons that they needed and it gave Roosevelt the political cover that he needed domestically to still be able to shovel those arms out. We're not in a situation where we can do that anymore. Um, if you look at the Lend-Lease Act historically for Roosevelt, it was one of the most cunning, masterful pieces of legislation that he that he pushed through in his entire presidency. President Biden doesn't have that same um, political capital within the American political establishment anymore. And what's happened, unfortunately, is that you have a Republican base that is now within Congress, uh, where it has now become a political litmus test that we just can't give weapons to Ukraine. It's stupid. It's ill-sighted. It is um, completely cynically politically motivated it, it, it but you know nevertheless this is the situation we got at this point i don't think that that's going to change unless there is a uh, a decisive electoral victory on the part of uh biden and the democrats in in the coming election that even though there are plenty of people within the republican congress who know that this is cynical and short-sighted and stupid. You know, they've drunk the Kool-Aid. That It is now uh, an act of tribalism on the part of the Republicans to say, whatever the orange god king thinks, you know, that's what we will do. So I, I don't know how to get out of that bind um, unless Trumpism is somehow defeated at the ballot box. That's, that's where we're at at this point. I would say... Um, that if you look at the the price of isolationism and what it cost us before the beginning of the second world war it is clear that isolationism now is just as bad an idea as it was back in the late 1930s early 1940s that this whole notion that 
somehow America is big enough and important enough that we don't have to care about having allies within this world is is just ludicrously wrong and stupid. Um, our security is intrinsically bound up with the security of our partners, particularly within Europe, but also our important partners within Asia, Japan, Australia, um, even to an extent, India. And we have to understand that people like Xi, uh, you know, in China are watching very closely how we behave with respect to the war in Ukraine. And I'll, I will tell, you know, my mouth breathing cohorts, you know, back from my home high school in Indiana, if we end up getting into a shooting war with the Chinese because they have judged us to be lacking in political willpower, you know, we're going to be looking back at uh, some of our actions with respect to Ukraine and to aid to them and be feeling really sheepish and stupid. You know, if you think it's if you think it's difficult to, and expensive to support your allies in peacetime, think about how expensive it's going to be to go to war without those allies. Uh, does it mean that isolationism, isolationism means the war? for USA. For example, war with China, war with Iran on the Middle East or somewhere else. Because sometimes it looks like a very attractive thing, but you say that not 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 usual. Yeah. Um I am extremely concerned about the security situation within the Pacific Ocean at this point. I Again, using historical analogs, I look at China now as being sort of Germany before World War I. Um, oh, 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 it is very interesting. It is very interesting. I, I, when you look at Germany before World War I, you had this bustling, vibrant, vigorous new power in the European context that had a massive chip on their shoulder, uh, felt that they had not received their due in, in terms of colonialism you know we got some colonies in africa but this is you know they were they were very against the uh the status quo in terms of basically who ruled the world then it was the british and the french right and they were determined to get their due on the world stage and be acknowledged as potentially the preeminent power on the world stage fast forward to china today you have a country that went through more than a century of national humiliation uh, at, at the hands of the colonial powers. And now, you know, are in some ways the world's largest economy. Um, but they also have some real demographic problems at home, uh, some economic problems at home. This is a country which is throwing its weight around frankly, and as being a very bad neighbor to its neighbors. And if you look at the situation within, uh, you know, the Pacific Basin and the way that they are bullying the Philippines and Vietnam and other countries in that area, and, and frankly, uh, throwing out territorial claims uh, around, you know, the Spratly Islands and, and so forth that are just ludicrous, but they don't think they're ludicrous. And, you know, all of those dynamics point to, I'm afraid to say, a shooting war between the Chinese and the Americans over, you know, uh, Chinese territorial aggrandizement. And I don't know, I don't know how that comes out. I don't want to be in a war against the Chinese. The Chinese should not want to be in a war against us. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the, I, I hate to say it, but that's sort of, where the, the tea leaves seem to be reading, which means, again, with respect to Europe, if we were smart, we would be sending messages to the Chinese in the, in the form of our actions in Ukraine and letting them know very clearly we support our allies. When we get into a, a war, even a proxy war, we're, we're playing to win. And don't think that we're soft or pushovers. You know, we we will fight you over Taiwan. 
those messages I don't think are being sent in a coherent and co- and consistent fashion at this point, and it's it's very troubling to me. Um, and, and so again, to the isolationists within our country, I would say your your reading of the situation is fundamentally false. You must broaden your perspectives and understand that we're playing a much larger game here. And there are a lot of other pieces at play besides just Ukraine. It's the aid that we send to Ukraine in real politic, grand strategic terms is drop in the bucket. It's the best investment we've ever made. This is the deal of the century. And it's also the right thing to do. (laughs) So come on, get with it, you know. But again, that's where we're at. Uh, I'll back to Ukraine, but uh, do you think that uh, the situation with North and South Korea is quite uh, complicated right now? Because some American experts tell me that they never feel uh, the situation so dangerous. I don't know. What is your analysis? Yeah, I am not an expert on the Korean Peninsula, but no, I, I watch you know, some of the, the same reports coming out of there that you do. And it, uh, there is a, there are a handful of analysts that are now saying that, um, that Kim has, has, has basically chosen war, uh, that he has, uh, renounced the idea of peaceful reunification of the Korean peninsula, which had always been a, a center point of North Korean state policy down through the decades and is, potentially lining him up himself up to take the offensive against South Korea. That may not be in the form of a full-scale invasion, but it could be things like artillery attacks, missile attacks. Um, and and there's a there's a there's a potential problem there as far as uh, Ukrainian situation too in that, South Korea is one of the world's largest producers of 155 millimeter shells. If the South Koreans are looking down the barrel of a potential war in their neck of the woods, all of a sudden they don't have a lot of spare capacity uh, to do the shell game that they've been doing, which is, you know, yeah, we'll sell shells to, you know, people within NATO knowing full well that those shells are immediately going to be turned around and sent to Ukraine. So yeah, I, I thank you for your analysis because you're you're very cleverly picking out. You know, the world is an interconnected place, and there are a lot of different hotspots that we've got to manage at this point. And it's it's really really dicey. Um, it's it's a very dangerous time, I think, within world history in terms of the number of potential flashpoints that are out there that could very quickly turn into a war. And the last question about the Ukraine, what do you think could be the game changer in this war? I continue to look at Ukraine's adaptability um, and the way that they are using network warfare components. I I think that drones are continuing to just f- fundamentally reshape how ground warfare is being waged. I don't know what what the future holds in terms of Ukrainian adaptability, but I I want it to be a surprise, right? Mm-hmm. I want to come in sometime in the summer of 2024, and the Ukrainian military has pulled out some brand new networked gizmo, you know, using drones and and coffee makers, and I I don't know what to suddenly be able to shut down significant segments of Russian surveillance systems, be able to ground uh, the Russian Air Force uh, in in tactical areas uh, on occasion. We don't need, what do I want to say? We just need to be able to have the ability at the tactical level in places of our choosing to be able to negate Russian um, surveillance and artillery systems sufficient that we can punch forces through these minefields, not have those minefields then sewn behind us again and again, those sorts of things. So I I don't know what is in Ukraine's trick bag. There have been a lot of rumors going around uh, in sort of the military analysis uh, circles. You know, we get tidbits from the American military of like, 
yeah, we've been in contact with Ukrainians and, you know, we're looking at their plan for 2024 and there's some pretty bold kind of maybe even semi crazy kind of approaches that they're taking. I don't know what those are. I want to be surprised by them. I, uh, you know, knock wood. I hope that sometime in 2024, we will get some sort of technologically based solution, which will allow us to create battlefield opportunity. Mr. Parshall, thank you so much uh, to be with us today. Thank you very much for your interview and thank you very much for possibility to read your analysis. It is Thanks very so much. interesting. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being here. Thanks so much for having me. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Parshall was our guest today and stay with us. Thank you.